Almost 50 years ago, the F-16 Fighting Falcon or Viper took to the skies. As the winner of the lightweight fighter competition, the aircraft was selected as the next frontline fighter by Belgium, Netherlands, Norway, and Denmark. The U.S. Air Force selected the fighter as a cheap sidekick for the F-15 Eagle. Yet why did the U.S. Navy then select the loser of the competition, the YF-17 Cobra, as the basis for their next fighter? The F-16 was the brainchild of a group of Air Force officers and civilian defense analysts nicknamed the Fighter Mafia, who in the 1960s and 70s advocated for fighter design criteria that went in opposition to the prevalent doctrine of that period. At that time, both Navy and Air Force were primarily focused on acquiring large, heavy fighters like the F-4 Phantom. Since the primary goal of such a fighter was to intercept Soviet bombers using missiles and beyond visual range fights, little attention was paid to close quarter dogfights. However, in Vietnam, due to a combination of restrictive rules of engagement, unreliable missiles and lack of adversarial training F-4 Phantoms had to fight in dogfights reminiscent of the aerial combat of World War II and World War I. In these fights, the heavy Phantoms struggled to gain the upper hand against agile and nimble MiG-21s and MiG-17s. One member of the fighter mafia, John Boyd developed together with Thomas Christie the energy maneuverability theory. This theory views the aircraft performance as the total of potential energies and allows for a quantitative model through which aircraft performance can be predicted. This model was then used in the development of the F-15, but the fighter mafia wanted to push the theory further. The F-15, although better than the Phantom in dogfighting capabilities, was still a heavy and expensive fighter. What the fighter mafia proposed was to use the energy maneuverability theory as a foundation for a no-frills fighter stripped of radar and unnecessary technology. Only equipped with a cannon and sidewinder missiles, this fighter would use its superior maneuverability to gain the upper hand in a dogfight. Without the whistles and bells, this fighter would also be cheaper than the F-15. This was music to the ears of the then Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger, who ordered a fly-off between two prototypes, the YF-16 and the YF-17. If you like this style of videos, you can support the channel by subscribing and leaving a like. Once the YF-16 won the competition, the Office of the Secretary of Defense started pressuring the Navy to select the YF-16 as well. The Navy was on the lookout for a replacement for the F-4, A-4, and A-7. However, they wanted more F-14s or at least another aircraft capable of carrying the Phoenix missile. Both the YF-16 and YF-17 were not designed for carrier duty, so respectively General Dynamics and Northrop needed to modify the existing designs. Northrop teamed up with McDonnell Douglas for what would become the F-18, while General Dynamics worked with Ling Timkovat to produce a naval version of the YF-16. Three navalized versions of the YF-16 were proposed, each using a different engine. The V-1600 was larger than the F-16 with a length of 52 feet 4 inches and an increased wingspan of 33 feet 3 inches. The landing gear was beefed up with a twin-nose wheel with catapult bar and a resting hook. On the right side of the aircraft was room for a retractable refueling probe. In the nose came a pulse Doppler radar since the Navy wanted to install AM-7 Sparrow missiles for beyond visual range combat. Both Sparrow and Sidewinder missiles would be carried on underwing pylons. Obviously, all these changes increased the weight of the aircraft compared to the F-16. The V-1601 was in between the F-16 and the V-1600 model, carrying less fuel and a more austere radar, although the capability remained to fire Sparrow missiles. The V-1602 was the greatest departure from the F-16 model with a redesigned wing and widened fuselage. There are multiple reasons why the Navy did not select any of the navalized F-16s. The most quoted reason is the two engines of the F-18 versus the single engine of the F-16. In case of engine trouble, an F-18 can still return to the carrier on one engine. An F-16 pilot would have no other option than to swim back home. Some point out to the low-hanging air intake of the F-16 as a possible other reason for the refusal for the F-16. But perhaps the most important reason was with the original design of the F-16 by the fighter mafia. The Navy wanted an aircraft that could carry bombs and rockets to replace the A-4 and A-7, but it also wanted an aircraft to complement the F-14 in aerial combat. This meant that a radar and Sparrow missiles were a non-negotiable requirement. This flew directly against the design of the F-16 as a pure fighter for close-by dogfights and would require extensive redesigns. In the meanwhile, the Air Force did not want a radar-equipped F-16 because that would threaten the procurement of the F-15, and thus Air Force vowed that nothing would be added to the original design of the F-16. 
Since the Navy demanded beyond visual range capability and the Air Force was reluctant to incorporate that in the F-16, the F-18 became the de facto aircraft for the Navy and Marines. Both F-16 and F-18 already have a successful career in the past 50 years. The F-18 Hornet evolved in the larger F-A-18 Super Hornet and EA-18G Growler. The F-16 would eventually get his radar and Sparrow capability followed by the AMROM, evolving from a simple lightweight fighter into a multi-role aircraft. Thank you for watching. If you want to see more aviation videos, follow these links.